nice pleasant voice. <laughs> okay, um, you know, one of the things I really love doing is um, listening to your devos. It's um, it's really great. It um, uh, just is very helpful in many different ways as we all work together in our walk with the Lord. And um, so, yeah, that's that's a, it's a, a really good and insightful um, opportunity for everybody. Um, and uh, on uh, when Jariah, when you were sharing. Um, with your Devo, you, you mentioned um, some things from the Samson narrative. Um, and it made me um, reflect back on some things that we covered in fundamentals class when we were talking about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit and also the doctrine of salvation. Um, and what is stated in uh, Judges 16 um, about um, the Lord departing from Samson, it, um, it brought to mind the uh, topic about the Holy Spirit and the difference between his work in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, so I want to just take a, a moment to talk about that. And uh, if you have any, any questions or anything uh, about that topic, we can spend a little bit of time reviewing it because it's, it's important. Um, in Judges 16, uh, here's the statement that the story kind of leads us to, and that is Judges 16, verse 20, where Delilah says, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he woke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. So very important statement of that dramatic irony that the uh, writer has been using all through the story. And um, this, is the, this is the climax of the story. When you get to uh, the climax of the story, after that point, you have uh, what's called the resolution. Uh, how does this all play out? After you reach that climactic part of the narrative, then what happens? And we are led into the resolution of the story in verse 22, where we read that Samson's hair start growing back. And uh, that, you know, that puts us at that position of, oh, you know, what, what's going to happen as a result of this? But that verse, verse 20, and the statement that uh, Samson did not know that the Lord had departed from him. What is that about? Well, you notice that it doesn't say that the Spirit of the Lord departed from him. And so that's one difference, because twice in the story of Samson, we read that the Spirit of the Lord um, came upon him, and <clears throat> he destroyed the lion. And, you know, so we have these statements about the Spirit of the Lord coming upon uh, Samson. But in this particular verse we read that the Lord departed from Samson. And if, if that raises a question, well, what does this mean with regard to Samson being a believer? Just go to Hebrews 11. We looked at Hebrews 11, and we see that there was faith in Samson's life. Now, that raises a bunch of other questions. <laughs> like, how on earth can Samson be regarded as a, a, a believer and an example of faith? Well, um, for, for one thing, it's because it's not about Samson. It's about what God does in people's lives. And we are all flawed. We are all unfit vessels for what God has called us to do, all of us. And we can choose to cooperate with the Lord and live a blessed life, or we can fight with them our entire lives like Samson did. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you know, he's just such an interesting character when it comes to um, people of faith. 
Um, but the bigger question then, um, for one thing, uh, salvation, Paul argues very strongly in the book of Romans, in the book of Galatians, and in the book of Ephesians. He argues very strongly that salvation, justification before the Lord, was never on the basis of works. It was never on the basis of the law of Moses. And he uses two prime examples to prove his point. This is part of purpose and argument. Um, <clears throat> he uses in Romans the example of Abraham. And he quotes from the Old Testament, from Genesis, that Abraham believed God and that was counted to him for righteousness. That is um, where salvation comes from. And he, the reason Paul uses Abraham as an example is because Abraham was long before Moses, long before there was a law, the old covenant in the law. So he uses Abraham to show the justification is by faith. And then the next example he uses is David somebody who was living under the Mosaic law. And he uses David to show that justification was not by the works of the law. <clears throat> so salvation in the Old Testament and the New Testament was the same. It was faith in God's promise. His promise in the Old Testament was that he would send a redeemer. He would send the seed of the woman to crush the head of the serpent. Um, and uh, in the New Testament, we look back on the fulfillment of that promise in Christ, and we place our faith in what was accomplished. So the Old Testament was looking forward in faith to God um, bringing a resolution to the problem of sin and restoring the relationship between fallen man and uh, himself. So, um, <clears throat> We do read in the Old Testament that the Spirit of the Lord um, came upon people in various circumstances. And when you look at uh, who is described and what is going on in those passages of Scripture, you have people in certain positions uh, fulfilling certain roles, doing various things. You have kings such as Saul, David, and uh, you have prophets, you have judges. The Spirit of the Lord was given as a special empowerment for these people to do what God had called them to do. Um, <clears throat> it was a temporary, uh, selective um, empowerment of God to do certain things. So um, Saul is a really good example of somebody who was probably not a believer. He was anointed to be king over Israel uh, because the Israelites had asked for a king, and Samuel told them, this is not a good idea. Uh, you are rejecting the Lord as being king over Israel, which is what God intended for the people of Israel. But they said, no, well, we'll reject the Lord as being king over us, and we want a person to be king over us. And so there was Saul. And when Saul was anointed as king, the spirit of the Lord came on him, and he began to prophesy. And you remember, people were shocked. And they it became a proverb we're told in the Old Testament, with the question, is Saul also among the prophets? They, they just couldn't, couldn't uh, reconcile that in their thinking because of who Saul was. But this was an example that God in his sovereignty and in his uh, grace empowers people to do certain things. Um, <clears throat> and it is not the same as salvation. Um, so when Samson, when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Samson, uh, there are 
specific instances in his life where we are told this happens, and it empowers him to do what God intended to do through Samson, which was to begin to deliver Israel from the Philistines. Um, and so that brings up um, the departure of the Spirit of the Lord from people like Saul. We read specifically in uh, 1 Samuel that the Spirit of the Lord uh, was removed from Saul, and God took the kingdom away from Saul. Uh, so again, it has nothing to do with the work of God in salvation. It has to do with him empowering people to um, fulfill certain um, uh, roles. And then we have David in Psalm 51, where he prays, do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. He's not talking about salvation. He has seen the result of um, walking in disobedience to the Lord and having the kingdom removed. Saul, the king who was uh, on the throne before him. David had seen this happen. And so as a result of his sin, when Nathan came and confronted David and said, you are the man, um, you know, David <clears throat> uh, broke down in repentance. And we have um, the result of that in Psalm 51 and his prayer in there, do not take your Holy Spirit away from me, is not, you know, don't, don't take salvation as, away. It says he wants to continue in the office that God had uh, called him to do, which was be, to be king over Israel. And um, so it has nothing to do with salvation. It has to do with um, God using him as um, uh, king over Israel. And <clears throat> so the big change happened at Pentecost in the New Testament, um, where people are still saved the same as they always have been by grace through faith. Um, but at Pentecost, now the empowerment of the Holy Spirit is universal on believers. Now, when we are, um, when we come, we are reconciled to God through Christ, we are uh, empowered by the Holy Spirit. He comes to indwell us permanently, and he gives us gifts. It's very similar to what happened in the Old Testament. But now, um, in the Old Testament, it was the nation of Israel where God select people. The church is different. Paul argues, especially in the book of Ephesians, that there is no longer a distinction between Jew and Gentile. The wall of division, Ephesians <clears throat> 1 and 2, talks about how Jew and Gentile used to be distinct, and Gentiles were strangers and afar off from God of the covenant. Now, under the new covenant, he has made both one. Now, there is a special union among believers, which is a part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and a special union of um, all people in Christ. And so, in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is given to all believers, and we are all gifted, and we are all accountable for what the Lord has empowered us to do in the body of Christ. So there are some close similarities between the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, and there are some very important differences. Um, so that's just kind of a brief overview <laughs> um, of uh, related to some topics that we have discussed before. So what are your questions? What are your thoughts uh, about those things? Uh, yeah, so one, with Samson in chapter 16, it doesn't say the Lord, Spirit of the Lord left him. It says the Lord left him. Right. Yeah, okay. Just, yeah. Gonna, just curious about that. Yeah, um, this is this is an example of what Paul is describing, and 
Romans 1 about um, giving people over to their own desires. And we talked about uh, how Samson was um, making decisions and living his life out of presumption rather than faith. Big difference there. And Samson had done that pretty much all of his life. He was constantly in conflict with the Lord working in his life. And so when um, Samson uh, mocked and pretty much denied um, his calling as a Nazarite, he has been doing this all of his life. And the one final thing that identified him as a Nazarite and the one thing that, um, that he held on to throughout his life, he gave it up. He told Delilah, here's the, the, what he turned the secret of his strength. Um, we talked about that. <laughs> that was not correct. Um, but uh, he gave that up. He denied it. And uh, so the Lord departed from him. Um, again, this is not a statement of uh, salvation. This is a statement of God's work in Samson's life. And what are the consequences, the biblical theological consequences of um, cause and effect, uh, sin, um, uh, you reap what you sow. All his life, Samson had been sowing for pleasure, for pride, and in this final scene between him and Delilah, he continues on that path, and the um, um, confession, I guess you could say, of uh, him being a Nazarite and telling uh, Delilah um, about his hair never being, and why it had never been shaved before, um, <clears throat> that was um, the, the final straw. That was the last uh, uh, thing that was uh, a part of his daily life that identified him in any way uh, with the God of Israel. Um, we talked before about how Israel had become indistinguishable from their Canaanite neighbors, and Samson had become the same. Uh, he also was no different. And this final thing that was a distinguishing a mark between who he was and who everybody else was, um, <clears throat> he gave up. And so God gave him up to the consequences of his actions. Um, and then his prayer, Lord, restore my strength. He, remember, we talked about how the reasons behind him wanting to do that uh, were pretty selfish. He had his own reasons. He wanted vengeance for the loss of his eyes. God had other reasons for granting him um, the answer to that prayer, and that was the um, destruction of the Philistines, the temple of Dagon, and the lords of the Philistines. So, yeah. Any other comments or questions or anything? So Old Testament believers had the Holy Spirit in them, just not empowering them the way we see in Samson or in the New Testament when people are doing miracles? Uh, yeah, they did have the Holy Spirit. Um, um, we are told that um, if you do not have the Holy Spirit, you are not a child of God. Uh, we read that a couple of passages uh, in the New Testament. <clears throat> um, yeah, but the, it's just very different in the Old Testament, especially along the lines of God's purpose for the nation of Israel. And he had a, a covenant with them that was conditional. And so we see a lot of things happening in the Old Testament that are very different from the New Testament because of the covenant and because uh, Christ's sacrifice had not been made yet. It would, you know, but their faith in what was coming um, was just like our faith of what has happened. 
Uh, think about the sacrificial system and how all the sacrifices were what, what is called vicarious. In my place, this sacrifice for sin, which cost the life of the animal I am bringing, this is in my place. The penalty of my sin is death. But in faith and uh, in a believing response to what God says, I am bringing this, I'm confessing my sins and offering this animal in my place. Blood was shed as a temporary covering of sin, looking forward to the one final perfect sacrifice for sin. So, yeah. It's a, it's a very worthwhile study to look at the differences uh, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, um, and uh, especially with the realization that God never had two different ways for people to be saved. Paul makes that point very, very strongly in his epistles. So, but it can be very confusing. <laughs> You know, especially as a new believer, you start reading about all these things that are happening in the Old Testament and, and uh, then all these deep theological discussions by Paul in the New Testament. And wow, you know, um, but that's that's awesome. That should stimulate our thinking and our response to God in worship as we realize what he has done throughout history. Um, uh, biblical theology is uh, also described as redemptive history. What has God done since the fall to bring redemption, salvation? It's awesome. God is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any other questions, any other comments? Keep digging. Keep getting into the word. It's awesome. Okay. Um, in honor of uh, the Samson narrative and trying to wrap it up between today and tomorrow with our overview, I wore my ironic shirt. I don't know what kind of irony that is. <laughs> there are various kinds, but I love this t-shirt. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's do a quick review of um, the slides we were looking at last week. So I'm going to share my screen. We will do a quick review of uh, what we have been looking at, and then we will continue from there. So <clears throat> here are some slides we were looking at. We did a quick, quick um, recap of the Samson narrative, uh, chapter by chapter. So we don't need to go through that again, but uh, we do have that. And then um, we have this list of how um, the narrative was um, was told and how the points were highlighted throughout the story of Samson through the use of irony, uh, ignorance of so many things. And this is not using the word in, in a derogatory way or trying to be insulting. It's just a statement of fact. Um, things were not known. Some of them we can expect and makes perfect sense. Um, Manoah did not know that it was the angel of the Lord. Well, yeah, um, that's to be expected. Uh, but there are things in the story that should have been known. And we, as the audience, are told about them. And um, if, if we are not aware of things, like what does it mean to be a Nazarite, um, we should go look that up. That's the part of, that is the point of irony, is to get us as the reader 
to understand what's going on, even though the uh, characters in the story are unaware of these things. Um, so we have several times in this story specifically stated that people did not know things were going on or what was happening, um, <clears throat> or things are hidden between the characters in the story, like Samson not telling um, about the lion and where the honey came from, things like that. Um, so the, uh, the use of irony is just amazing in uh, the Samson narrative. Then we took a look at Samson's speeches. And we did this because uh, we have so much in the Samson narrative of Samson talking. Um, when you read through the narrative, you might not pick up on how much of his speech we actually have recorded, but we have a lot of it. So we have this screen, we have this one, um, all through chapter um, uh, 15, and um, 15 into 16 as he is playing this teasing game with Delilah, <clears throat> and then at the very end. And we took a look at this, keeping in mind what Jesus said, that it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. And so by looking at Samson's words, we get a really good idea of what's in his heart. And we see that he is pretty much uh, consumed with himself. <clears throat> All right. What we are going to do next is to take a look at the structure <clears throat> of the story. We've seen that irony is used throughout the narrative to highlight specific things that we need to be aware of, even though the characters in the story were not aware of them. Now, the structure of the story shows us how, by putting it together and telling the story in a certain way, um, how the author is, is um, arranging this. This is the argument, the structure of the argument. And so here we see a very beautiful <clears throat> um, um, set of three things that happened as a mirror of each other. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this in a little more detail in a minute, but you see there is first an account of death at the hands of Samson, followed by significant damage, the burning of the fields, and then an account of death at the hand of Samson. Then we repeat that cycle. A thousand killed by the hand of Samson, significant damage to the city of Gaza, followed by death again, but this time it is death of the Philistines, Samson's own death, and at the same time, significant damage to the temple. So let's take our break two minutes early, and uh, we'll see you at 9.15. Let me stop there. All right, see you in a few. Whoops, there we go. <laughs> we don't have, um, uh, you know, like some of the prophets, we have um, uh, their um, prophecies and things like that written down or quoted or something like that. We don't have that for Noah, but that's what he's described as. Yeah. Okay, good question. Welcome, Brittany. Okay. Let's get back to our screens. Okay. Um, so, we gave a very brief overview of the structure of the Samson narrative. Um, it, it always strikes me 
whenever whenever you see patterns like this in uh, Old Testament passages about how, how beautifully they're put, put together. And you know, we talked last week about how um, even in movies that are very sad and, and you leave the theater in tears, um, you still talk about what a great movie that was. <laughs> um, uh, Augustine in um, uh, his autobiography, The Confessions of St. Augustine, uh, he talks about entertainment. That was a uh, um, something that he was kind of addicted to. Uh, he went to plays all the time. And uh, he, he had some really interesting things to say about uh, how we can be moved emotionally um, in ways that we would never uh, want to happen to us in real life. And yet when it happens through the vehicle of entertainment, uh, we consider it good. <laughs> so it is a really interesting discussion. But you have that kind of thing here <clears throat> in the Samson narrative. It's a tragic story, um, but beautifully told. And you see that in the structure, especially after chapter 13, where we have uh, some, some really interesting things discussed there um, by themselves. When we get into the, uh, the actual narrative of Samson, uh, we have um, details that show the fulfillment of Samson's purpose. In chapter 13, we are told that this child was to be a Nazarite to God from birth and that he would be used to begin to deliver Israel from the Philistines. We talked a little bit before also about how in the book of Judges, we have um, at various points, especially up to uh, the story of Gideon, we have uh, little time references. In biblical narrative, the chronological timeline is not the plot device. It's not the frame of the story. The theme being discussed is the plot device. It's the, the theme, um, is the, the way the plot is put together. Um, <clears throat> so God is going to use Samson to begin this process. And um, we read at first that um, the Philistines had dominion over Israel for a, a period of years. But instead of there being um, a period of rest and quiet after Samson. What we read after the Samson narrative are accounts of the total anarchy and, and godless condition of the people of Israel in chapter 17 through 21. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's horrible. We also have seen, such as in the story of Deborah and Barak, that judges were fulfilling their role as a judge during times of oppression. So not all of the judges delivered Israel from the oppressor, totally throwing off the yoke of the oppressor, oppressor and resulting in a period of, of quiet and peace. <clears throat> that doesn't happen all the time. <clears throat> Samson is going to begin the work of delivering Israel from the Philistines and this period of oppression doesn't end until the time of David, even though uh, Samson accomplished uh, quite a lot of the work of uh, stirring up this conflict between Israel and the Philistines. Um, one of the points of the Samson narrative, since it is so focused on him as a judge, is not the deliverance of Israel, but <clears throat> the, um, the decline in the spiritual um, health of the nation as well as the judges themselves. So here's how the story is put together. We see that Samson is used 
um, initially <clears throat> um, by killing th 30 men and then destroying crops and then death again at the early part of chapter 15. And then that cycle is repeated. Um, but think about um, what motivated Samson in the first cycle of death, damage, and death. Why was he doing this? Uh, pride and desire. That's a big one. Yep. Yep. And what was he avenging? We have this word, his rounds of revenge. Um, his pride had been um, um, affronted, insulted. Uh, they used his wife against him, things like that. Uh, so what was going on in his life that um, caused these, this first round of revenge? Almost, I hate to say injustice, but um, that's the closest word I can think of. He, he, was, he should have won the riddle game, but because they basically cheated and got his wife to get it out of him, it's, that's pretty low. Yeah, 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 you're right. This first round of revenge um, all revolves around his wife. Um, there is <clears throat> 30 men were killed, and like you just said, Alejandro, uh, they used his wife against him. Then the significant damage is they took his wife away from him. And then an unknown number were slaughtered um, after Samson's former wife and father in law were killed by the Philistines. Uh, they come after him and um, an unknown number is slaughtered. <clears throat> so it's all about, it all centers around Samson and his wife from Timnah. Um, the second round where a thousand are killed and then Gaza made defenseless and then 3000 killed. Here, things have escalated and um, we have Samson, um, responding out of anger and, and um, frustration and, and things like that. So this first act down here at the bottom of this screen, the first act, uh, prideful response out of his anger <clears throat> and his last act, this is vengeance again. And the question comes up, um, is there some spiritual awareness in here? Um, we do see some evidence of spiritual awareness in Samson's life. After killing the thousand, he, he, his thirst was to the point of, um, he, he, he pretty much exaggerated, of course, the, the whole situation, but he said, he prayed to the Lord and he says, are, are you going to let me die now? You know, after I did all this great stuff, are you gonna let me die of thirst? And so God provided uh, water for him. Um, but, uh, you know, he was praying, uh, you know, God doesn't give brownie points for good things that we do in our life, <laughs> you know? um, but uh, there, there at least is some indication that Samson is aware of the God of Israel, that God is one that you uh, can speak to, uh, that you can pray. And uh, so, you know, there, there is some indication in there of his spiritual awareness. And again, we have to always keep in mind Hebrews 11, that he is held up as an example of God using people to accomplish his work. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the framework for the story, <clears throat> two rounds or two cycles uh, built around the theme of death and destruction and ending with um, both of them being done together. Um, more people killed 
than he had killed in his lifetime and the damage done here. Um, and not only rendering the same city, remember he's in the same place, Gaza, where he had pulled the gates out of the city wall. He's back in Gaza, this time as a prisoner, and this time he doesn't um, destroy the um, gates of the city, he pulls down the temple of Dagon. So their God is defeated, and they had given Dagon credit for the capture of Samson. And then Samson pulls the temple down. <laughs> Another kind of irony uh, in the story. Uh, so beautifully tell, told um, with tragedy after tragedy happening, happening in Samson's life. <clears throat> All right, another key element in the story, Samson's three women. First, his wife. And if you look at the descriptions of Samson and his relationship to these women, <clears throat> his wife was one that he says, she pleases me well. <coughs> Excuse me. And that is repeated in chapter 14, uh, first of all in verse three, but then in verse seven, it's repeated. She pleased Samson well. So that was his motivation for marrying her. I like her. She looks good. She makes me happy. Um, all insufficient reasons. They're not irrelevant. Hopefully, you like the person that you marry <laughs> and uh, that you're attracted and all of that. Those are all wonderful things, uh, but they're not uh, sufficient in and of themselves. Um, uh, his wife uses <clears throat> his um, maybe lack of emotional response to her. <coughs> Um, but she reproaches him for not loving her. So you only hate me, you do not love me. And um, in response to her pestering him to give him the answer to the riddle, we read that he told her because she pressed him so much. So we see Samson being attracted to Philistine women. Um, but he, his tolerance, his inner character, his ability to um, um, show some kind of inner strength um, is easily eroded by plying him. Um, the use of his weakness against him is uh, resulting in um, him giving in. <clears throat> Um, the Gaza harlot. We're not told anything about her except the fact that he went in to her. <coughs> we talked about how that doesn't necessarily mean, mean that he went in to sleep with her, but you certainly get that impression from the story. But we're just not given detail. Um, but um, but there it is, um, this harlot, and he goes in to, to be with her. And uh, that, that whole thing about um, the people of Gaza waiting at the gates of the city, uh, they were going to wait till the morning to capture Samson, but he shows up at midnight. So that's an interesting part of that story. And then we have Delilah. He loved a woman in the Valley of Sorek. So he's back to where this whole thing started. Timnah was in the Valley of Sorek. He married a Philistine woman from the Valley of Sorek. Now he's back there, and this time he loves a woman. And Delilah, we mentioned before, is the only one who is named. We don't know his mother's name, his wife's name, the harlot's name but we do know Delilah. And um, so we have a lot of detail in the Delilah paracope. Remember that word? <clears throat> so he loved her 
you compare that with his wife, she pleased Samson, but with Delilah, he loved her. Samson's wife used the word love as a reproach, you do not love me. Delilah does the same thing, worded a little bit differently, but here she is using his words against him. How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? <clears throat> so both uh, his wife and Delilah um, come at him from an, an emotional appeal and reproach about how his actions are not reflective of either his words or what should have been his relationship with his wife. So the result between Delilah and Samson is the same as between Samson and his wife. He was pressed until he gives in. Um, it's interesting, we're not told that Samson loved his wife um, and that his response to her uh, pressing him was that he gave in. We are told he loves Delilah and his emotional response to her using that against him is that his soul was vexed to death. So it's an interesting thing to think about <clears throat> the investment of his emotional frame of mind with his wife wasn't as deep as with Delilah. So his response to his wife was giving in because he was irritated but because he had emotionally invested himself with Delilah, his response to her was that his soul was vexed to death. So you see a, um, an emotional response from Samson that is um, very much at the same level of what he invested into his relationship. <clears throat> we see that in daily life. What you invest your heart in is um, going to show up in your responses to those situations. Okay, we're getting some interesting character sketches here from Brittany. What do those mean? Smiley face, frowny face. They're in reference to the notes you've got there. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty clever. <laughs> yeah, I'm scratching the mouth. That's funny. All right. So <clears throat> looking at Samson from a couple different perspectives, it's, it's important to note that we are given these details in the story. So we need to consider them. Um, and comparing them to one another is, is a very interesting exercise. All right, next. The main elements used to tell the story. Irony. We are constantly told <clears throat> of things that are not known by the characters, uh, but should be. <clears throat> Speeches. The words that are used in the Samson narrative have to do with games, proclamations, these boastful things that um, Samson talks about, the teasing that goes on, and we have two prayers, uh, neither one of which are model prayers of devotion and faith and dependence, but still, given who Samson is, the fact that he prays at all, <laughs> is, is uh, kind of amazing. The story is told um, on the framework of these rounds of revenge and the three women in Samson's life. These are the main elements within the story. <clears throat> and they are used to uh, describe and bring to us as readers as parts of the elements the themes 
What are the themes? Well, irony, like we talked about, show us topics that should or could be known but aren't. What is a Nazarite? This is something they should have known, but they didn't. Uh, and they could have known if they had gone to maybe a faithful priest or Levite who was familiar with the law of Moses, they could have found out. But did they even know where to go to find the answers? Yeah, we don't, we don't get an indication that they did, but this, this is a sad state of affairs. Manoah, I want you to raise your son as a Nazarite. And Manoah says, I don't know what that means. Did he do anything about that? The only thing that Samson seems to be aware of is his hair when it comes to being a Nazarite. So the use of irony is highlighting for us um, a lack of understanding. This is a reflection of um, Judges 2, verse 10. Let me read that to you again. <clears throat> After talking about Joshua, we read, when all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. Samson, <clears throat> the narrative is highlighting to us the result of failing to communicate who God is and what he does to our children. It's pretty tragic. Through the use of Samson's speeches, his um, um, uh, I wouldn't say addiction to games, but, you know, he's, he's so willing to enter into uh, these games and riddles and things that this shows the abuse of the role of the judge. He was in the position where other judges had been that would... Um, provide a, a great opportunity for the judge as well as the people of Israel to uh, get back on track spiritually with the Lord. But Samson abuses that role. He is more concerned about um, playing these games and giving these boastful proclamations and being involved with Philistine women. He's more concerned about that than fulfilling the role of the judge. And that role should be one of wisdom and leadership. But that role is abused by Samson. Probably because he didn't even understand the role of the judge. These um, elements within the narrative also <clears throat> point out the degeneracy of the judge mirroring the degeneracy of Israel. Uh, he, Samson does not at all stand out as someone who is going to gather Israel and lead them in any kind of positive direction in terms of who they are as a nation, God's chosen people, and who they are before the Lord, God's holy people, kingdom of priests. It also highlights to us our, our uh, silver lining in this dark cloud, and that is the grace and power of God to use the unfit to accomplish his purpose. Are any of us fit? No, we're not. We are dead in trespasses and sin. He redeems us 
He equips us and then he invites us to respond to him and walk in dependence of, on him. So those elements of the story highlight the themes that are being brought to us as readers of the Samson narrative. So we're getting really close to understanding what is the point? What is the point of the narrative? And when we were looking at epistles, we saw that epistles <clears throat> typically follow a pretty logical structure of um, stating the purpose of the epistle, either explicitly, I am writing this to you because, or implicitly by focusing on um, a particular topic. And then there's a logical structure in there. We are told uh, point A, point B, and then we're told therefore, or because of this, or for this reason, um, epistles are written that way. Narrative gives us that kind of um, <clears throat> point through story. And it is how the story is written, the um, <clears throat> devices, the uh, things that are used to communicate those points. In the Samson narrative, it is irony is used to uh, highlight these elements. <clears throat> okay, um, here's a good place to pause. You have questions or comments about what we're discussing here? So if you're, if I'm trying to find <clears throat> like the argument of a narrative, I'm not necessarily looking for like a, a direct statement. I'm looking for a theme or like the elements are, that are used in it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And what's really interesting about the Samson narrative is that the the narrator steps into the story and gives us little glimpses of what he's highlighting. And these are those statements they did not know. Um, you don't see that a lot in biblical narrative. A lot of times you'll read an entire account of somebody like Elijah or Elisha, and the, <clears throat> the narrator rarely, if ever, steps into the story and makes a narrative comment. So it's how the story is told, what are the themes and the topics being developed, and um, <clears throat> what is being emphasized and repeated and things like that. So uh, it takes a little more thought to <clears throat> figure out the argument, uh, the purpose and the argument of a narrative, uh, but it's there and we see it <clears throat> when you take the time to pull it apart and think about how is the story told and what exactly is being emphasized in this story. <clears throat> Remember how we talked in the Delilah Paracope that there's so much that we are not uh, told at all. We read about Samson breaking free of his bonds and there's nothing told us about uh, Delilah's response, what the Philistines did in response. Did they run? Did he chase them? We're not given any of that information. We're just told he did this, and then immediately Delilah says, oh, you're mocking me and telling me lies. Now tell me, really, where does your strength come from? You know, so <laughs> there is so much in there that we're not told. Why? Because it's not the point. The point is those teasing rounds of the game Tell me, tell me, tell me. Um, <clears throat> that's what the reader wants us to focus. I mean, the writer wants us to focus on. I'd sure like to know <laughs> some of those details, but uh, we're not given them. Okay. <clears throat> so here is the cycle of judges, which we see reflected in the Samson narrative as well. Um, <clears throat> There is disobedience and falling progressively downward. We see this in the nation of Israel. 
And then typically in um, each of the narratives, each of the uh, individual stories of the judges in the book of Judges, we have a groaning of the people of Israel and a crying out to God. And in response to that, usually, we have the raising up of the judge. Remember in Judges chapter 10, after several of these cycles, when the people cry out to God, God says, no, I'm not going to deliver you this time. <clears throat> you go cry to the gods you have chosen to serve. Um, and that was a very painful thing um, for the Lord to see the suffering of his people. <clears throat> but usually, after the crying out to God, there's the raising up of a judge, and then God is with the judge for deliverance, which then usually takes us into <clears throat> um, a period of time where the judge is um, uh, in some capacity ruling over the Israelites until the judge dies. And then um, after a period of rest and uh, quiet, the cycle starts all over again. So we see this repeated throughout the uh, stories of the judges. An interesting thing about the Samson narrative is that this outline is also an outline of Samson's own life. Let's take a look at that. The disobedience and the falling progressively downward we see in Judges 13 through 15, where Samson progressively spirals down. He gets more and more out of control. He is more and more full of rage and revenge, anger. Um, so his personal life reflects his progressive downward spiral. Until you get to chapter 16, where Samson himself is brought into captivity. So this is a reflection of what happens to the whole nation. The whole nation progressively spirals down until they are brought into captivity. <clears throat> this is what happen happens in Samson's own life. Usually at that point of captivity, there's a crying out to God. And we see Samson cries out to the Lord. In response to that prayer, God raises up a judge. Samson is raised up. In spite of the fact that he is blind and in capture, Samson takes hold of the pillars. He is poised for deliverance. <clears throat> and the next thing that God usually does is um, enable the judge to, del to deliver the people here, Samson destroys the temple of Dagon. And the next part of the cycle is the judge dies and the cycle starts again. And we end with Samson dying. So his whole life is a mirror of what is happening to the whole nation. Alejandro, are you going to say something? Yeah. Um... Generally, when the nation of Israel turns to God and cries out for help, it, it's it's a from point of repentance and realizing they were wrong and that they need God. But it never says that about Samson when he's uh, crying out to God in the end. Right. Yeah, um, because the the downward spiral is a progression, and what we see happening is instead of a return. Um, like at the first couple of judges, um, that response back to the Lord is weaker and weaker uh, to the point where you get to Samson as a judge, and we do not see that happening at all. So that, that 
indistinguishable difference between Israel and the nations is reflected in Samson himself. And um, they just enter into a, a long period of oppression by the Philistines until David. Any other comments, any other questions? Okay. Yeah, despite having, uh, just despite you going over Samson, or the story of Samson several times, I hadn't quite realized how, quite the state they were in, because it, it doesn't say that the Israelites cried out to God. Right. The only time we see uh, the Israelites themselves speaking is when they come to Samson and say, don't you know the Philistines have dominion over us? Why are, you, why are you doing this? They're not asking for a judge. They go actually to their judge and say, we're going to deliver you to our enemy. So it's, it's just totally backwards and just a... <laughs> It's, it's tragic humor. Does that make sense? <laughs> they just don't understand. You know, they ask Samson, don't you know who the Philistines are? They should be asking, who are you? Are, are you the judge? Or are you the one who are gonna, who's going to lead us out of this whole mess? No, they're, they're not aware of it. Samson's not aware of it. So, yeah, you're right. The, um, <clears throat> the degeneration of the nation is uh, just shocking. <clears throat> And in order to drill that point home, read chapter 17 through 21. It's abysmal. It's horrible. And then don't stop after Judges. Read Ruth. Otherwise, you'll, you'll find yourself in a, <laughs> in, a, in a really dark cloud. You need this story of Ruth to help you sh to show us that um, in spite of the period of judges being what it is, uh, you've got Ruth and Boaz. Awesome. Awesome. <clears throat> yeah, it never clicked just how far gone the Israelites were at the time of Samson. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you also have um, the opening of 1 Samuel. You've got Hannah, who is a, a beautiful believer, and um, going to a judge um, and, uh, um, you know, the birth of Samson, I mean, uh, Samuel, and, um, and all of that too. So there are some, some really wonderful glimmers of hope. Um, it's, it's a really awful situation, but there are some, some glimmers of hope. It's just like God told Elijah. I mean, Elijah said, I'm the only one left. God says, I have several thousand who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So we see the overall picture of a horrible situation, but we are given those little glimmers of hope, and we see that God always preserves uh, what's uh, termed in the scriptures as a remnant, the remnant of believers. Yeah. All right, <clears throat> so the argument of the Samson narrative. Israel's become indistinguishable from corrupt Canaanites. This is the historical and spiritual context of judges. It's the condition of the judges themselves that they were supposed to address. Um, the physical deliverance was to give uh, the nation an opportunity for spiritual renewal. And this is becoming less and less and less the case as we progress through the uh, story of the judges. The judge also is becoming indistinguishable. And um, that's the point of the Samson narrative is that Samson is as corrupt as Israel. They are as corrupt as the Canaanites. And we see in narrative that there is a conflict. And uh, there are typically... Um, only a couple of kinds of conflict that um, are, are seen in narrative, and that is man against man, 
a man against nature or a man against himself. And here we see this spiritual inward battle that uh, Samson is losing hand over fist. Um, but God still accomplishes what he said he would do through Samson. He is not limited, deterred, or thwarted by sin. Sin is not a problem that puzzles God, that is in any way a worthy challenge to who he is and what he is doing. He is sovereign. He limits sin. He constrains it. And even in the process of discipline, he uh, accomplishes his work. And uh, we can, like we've said before, we can cooperate with his work or we can resist it. It doesn't matter in terms of is God actually going to do what he said he's going to do? Yeah, he is. Where are you going to fit into that work? So the telling of the story, how it is told brings us to understand this is what we are reading about. And we see um, a horrible spiritual condition within the nation of Israel um, and uh, within the lives of the judges themselves. So some things to look for, um, <clears throat> kind of, Jariah, what you were talking about, asking about just in terms of um, what do you do with narrative when you're looking for the point of the story. Um, I will put this in uh, Campus SIS because we are out of time. Um, but here are some guidelines to use as you are reading through narrative and trying to answer the question, what is this here for? What's the point? And uh, what, can I, what can I get from the story? What, what should I get from the story? So I will put this in Campus SIS. And um, <clears throat> tomorrow, um, we will start talking about poetry, Hebrew poetry. So we are going to move on into the Psalms and spend some time there and do the same thing. What's the point? And what's the argument? even within the Psalms, okay. 10.01, man, I don't like going over. <laughs> Time for us to be done. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, bye-bye.